My name is Ashley Lohr, and I'm the host of the Lansing Symphony's LSO Kids program. As an LSO kid, you get the chance to hear from Lansing Symphony musicians and their instruments, hear stories read by local celebrity music teachers, and learn a fun activity that you can do from home. For today's first guest, I have Christine from the Lansing Symphony, and she has an absolutely gorgeous instrument to share with us today. is that and what family of instruments is it from? Yeah, so this is a viola. It is from the string family and I actually brought out my violin to show you. So violins and violas are from the same string family but can you see the difference? There's a big difference. Right? So violas are larger than violins. They're like the middle child of the string family. Um, their big brothers are the cello and the bass, but the viola is nice and warm. It has a high register, sort of like the violin, but not as high. And then it goes down low and big and hearty like a cello, but not quite as low. Oh, neat. So what is it made out of? So it's made out of wood and it is has uh, these four strings on it that you can probably see there. And those are made out of a synthetic material and also um, metal. So mostly wood with a little bit of metal. Very neat. And I, I noticed when you were playing, you were using that stick to make sound. Is that how you make the actual sound? Yeah. So this is what's called a bow. And you see that there's this white portion of it and then the brown portion. The white portion is actually made out of horse hair. So like the tail of a horse, that's what's on my bow. And what happens is when you put the hair of the bow on the string of the instrument, these tiny little hooks catch the string and make it vibrate back and forth. So you see, there's one other cool sound that my instrument can make and that's called pizzicato. And that's when I take my fingers instead of my bow sound more like a guitar. Oh, that's so neat. I'm wondering, can you play some high sounds and some low sounds on that for us? Sure. So the very lowest note I can play is the open C. You heard that at that very first piece I played. <clears throat> it's called the Prelude from Suite Number 3 by J.S. Bach, and it goes from my A string all the way to my lowest note. So that's my C string. But then I can play fairly high notes too. One neat trick that I think is cool about string instruments is you can play these things that are called harmonics, which is when you just lightly touch the string with your finger and by stopping the vibration of the string, it sounds a very high note like this. So super high, awesome notes there, but also that low range. Wow, those super high notes, they sound a little bit scary, but also really fun. Yeah, they're used in scary music a lot. <laughs> I wondered, it sounded like that. Um, I'm wondering, can you maybe play something fast for us? Sure. So I thought I would play a excerpt from a piece called The Midsummer Night's Dream. It's by Felix Mendelssohn, and it's a piece we play in orchestra a lot, and it's about fairies. So I think you can hear the fairies dance in our part. <laughs> I 
definitely hear the fairies. That was so cool. Um, can you play something slow for us too? Yeah, I wanted to play something slow that's actually a solo piece for viola. It's called The Romance by Max Brook. Now, most of the time, the viola is playing within the orchestra. You don't see a viola soloist soloing with orchestra very often. But I think this piece is really beautiful, and it exemplifies how slow can be really gorgeous on a viola. That was just absolutely gorgeous. I really liked the different dynamics or, or the different volumes that you played. Um, or would you maybe play something quietly for us? Sure. So in orchestra, one of my favorite composers is Johannes Brahms. He lived in the 19th century and he's known for playing incredibly, uh, composing incredibly beautiful melodies. And the fourth movement of his symphony, number three, starts out with all of the strings playing this super mysterious melody. And it's marked pianissimo sotto voce, which is a fancy Italian word for under voice. And I think it's super creepy, and I wanted to share it with you. <laughs> Wow, that was really exciting. And yes, I could definitely hear the creepiness in it. <laughs> um, could you maybe now play something for us uh, loudly too? I heard that a lot in uh, some of the examples that you were playing before. Yeah, so one thing that I thought would be cool to show you is that in playing a string instrument, unlike a wind instrument or a brass instrument, we have four strings. So we can play up to four notes at once. And that makes us sound a lot louder and fuller. So at the very end of that box, suite number three, there are a bunch of those places where I play four notes together, and it's called quadruple stops. Here's what it sounds like. <laughs> hearing those different notes happening at the same time. That was really neat. I think it's one of the coolest things about playing a string instrument. So how old were you when you started playing? I started when I was 11 and then I started taking lessons when I was 13, which is kind of late for a string player. Wow. Now why is that late for a string player? Do like two-year-olds usually start playing? Yeah, you know, not two-year-olds, but it's pretty common for four or five-year-olds to start playing. Of all the instruments there are to choose from, what made you choose the viola? So this is kind of a funny story. I started in my public school string program, and we were all supposed to sign up for instruments in the fifth grade during lunch. We had seen a bunch of instrument examples. And I really kind of wanted to play a wind instrument, but at that point I had asthma, and so I didn't think it was a very good idea. 
So I decided I'd play a string instrument, and as I stood in line, I got up to the front, and I noticed that no one had signed up for the viola, and I felt so bad that no one wanted to play this instrument, and so I signed up. And a lot of years later, it's part of my career. <laughs> Well, I'm really, I'm sure that the viola is really happy that you decided to play it. <laughs> um, so how much time do you spend practicing? You sound just so accomplished. Thank you. I practice every day. So one of my favorite quotes is by Itzhak Perlman, and he says, practice only on the days that you eat. So <laughs> I like eating every day. Um, no, but I find that uh, playing is something that makes me happy and feeds my soul, as well as when I want to play with an orchestra, I want to sound the best that I can. So that means preparing my own part so that when I get to rehearsal, I'm ready to play everything with my section and with the rest of the orchestra. I think it's really amazing to come in as one person and then to be surrounded with 70 other people who are all playing different parts and produce this big, beautiful work that there's no way that me with my one viola, there's no way that I could do that by myself. That's great. Um, is there anything else that you really, really enjoy about being a professional musician? Yeah, I would say I love how it gives you a chance to meet people from all across the country and world. Um, the people that I play with in orchestra come from places like Korea and China and Australia and Kansas. And it's so neat to meet people from all over. And then when we get to talk to audiences after the concert, I get to meet a lot of different people too. So I guess I think meeting people is one of the coolest parts about being a professional musician. You know, Christine, it's so rare that I ever get the chance to hang out with a viola. I'm wondering, do you have one more thing that you could play for us today? Actually, I do. So in addition to working for the Lansing Symphony, I also work for the MSU College of Music. And I thought, you know, string players don't get to play in marching band, but that doesn't mean we can't sing the fight song. So I wanted to offer you the chance to sing along while I play the Michigan State fight song. <laughs> fun. I feel like we've learned a ton about the string family and especially the viola. I think my favorite part was when you were talking about the different ways that you can make sound on your instrument. You had just a couple beautiful ways that you could play with your bow and then you also had that one that was called pizzicato where you were strumming it a little bit or plucking the strings. Um, I'm wondering if the LSO kids can do a fun little thing with me really quickly. Can you please repeat after me and say pizzicato? And then this time I'm going to go like this with my fingers, with my four fingers, and I'm going to go pizzicato. Try that with me. Here we go. Pizzicato. Awesome. And this time we're going to go a little bit faster. Ready? Here we go. Pizzicato. Awesome. Up next, I have a special celebrity guest. She is from the DeWitt Schools, and she has a story for us that is actually based on a true story. It's about a man named Joseph Haydn, who was a composer and a musician, and he wrote this very special symphony called the Farewell Symphony. 
Here is Mrs. Broughton from DeWitt Schools to read to you the Farewell Symphony. Hi everyone, my name is Mrs. Broughton and I teach music in DeWitt. I'm going to read you the Farewell Symphony by an old teacher of mine, Anna Harwell Talenza. The Farewell Symphony. Where are my trunks of clothes, bellowed Prince Nicholas, and my chest set and the silver candlesticks? They are all on the wagon, sir, replied a weary servant. Hide in, the prince shouted. Are the instruments packed? What about the musicians? Where are all the musicians? They are saying farewell to their families, sir, Haydn replied. Well, tell them to hurry up, barked the prince. I am ready to leave. This was the scene at Prince Nicholas's winter estate in Eisenstadt, Austria, on a sunny March morning in 1772. The winter snow had just started to melt, and Prince Nicholas was preparing for the annual move to his summer palace in the Hungarian countryside. The palace was called Esterhaza and it was the prince's pride and joy. Accompanying the prince were 22 musicians and the royal music director, Joseph Haydn. Haydn was an excellent composer, famous throughout Europe. He, was, he wrote music for Prince Nicholas, but that was not his only responsibility. He also made sure that the musicians practiced diligently and stayed out of trouble. Haydn was even in charge of repairing broken instruments. The musicians had many duties themselves. They were hired to keep Prince Nicholas and his many guests entertained. This was by no means an easy task. Prince Nicholas could never have enough musical entertainment. He demanded opera and ballet in the evenings, chamber music in the afternoons, outdoor music for strolls in the garden, dance music at formal balls, dinner music with special meals, heralding trumpeters for the arrival of guests, and sacred music for the palace chapel. In short, Haydn and the musicians were kept very busy at Esterhaza, so busy that they hardly missed their wives and children during the first few weeks. As summer wore on, though, homesickness set in and the musicians began to complain. Toward the end of July, the first violinist, Tomasini, came to Haydn and pleaded, Papa Haydn, will you please go to Prince Nicholas and request that our families be allowed to join us? We are working very hard to please His Majesty and it would comfort us so if our wives and children were here. The next day, Haydn went to the prince. Your Highness, he cautiously began, the musicians have asked me to speak to you. They are all quite homesick and they miss their families. Please, sir, will you give them permission to invite their loved ones to Esterhaza? What? the prince roared. They want to invite their families? Never have I heard such impertinence. Who do the musicians think they are? The palace only has 126 rooms. With all my important guests, there is not enough room for each servant's family. Haydn, you tell your musicians that if they want to keep their jobs, they will learn to live without their families for a while. A dejected Haydn returned to his quarters. The musicians were waiting for him. What did he say, they asked. When can we send for our families? Never, Haydn glumly replied. The prince will not allow it. What? The musicians roared. Never have I known such cruelty, shouted Tomasini. We should march over to the palace and let Prince Nicholas know how angry we are. Yes, cried the others. We should tell the prince just how we feel. No, listen to me, please, Haydn interrupted. Going to Prince Nicholas will only make matters worse. He has threatened to fire those who complain again. Living without your families might be difficult, but living without your wages would be impossible. Please, gentlemen, do not make trouble. The end of summer is only a few weeks away. Before you know it, we will all be home again. Papa Haydn is right, Tomasini admitted. We cannot fight the prince. We should get back to work and wait for the end of summer. At 
And so they did. Week after week passed, but Prince Nicholas never announced it was time to leave. The days grew shorter, a chill crept into the air, the leaves changed color, and the prince never talked about going home. The musicians grew restless. In November, Thomasini approached Haydn in a state of panic. Papa Haydn, he cried, why is the prince keeping us here so long? Please go to him and convince him it is time to go home. But Haydn was cautious. He remembered how the prince had reacted the last time the musicians made a request. It will take a great deal of cleverness and tact to influence the prince, Haydn thought to himself. He turned to, Tom to Tomasini and said, tell all the musicians to be patient and continue their duties as usual. I will think of something. Haydn went for a walk in the garden and tried to think of a plan. He retired to his room and paced up and down. Think, think, he muttered to himself. But no matter how hard he tried, Haydn could not find a solution. Frustrated, he sat down at his harpsichord and began working on a new com composition to take his mind off his troubles. All at once it came to him, the perfect plan. Haydn quickly pulled out a fresh piece of paper and feverishly began working on a new symphony. Less than two weeks later, he presented the finished symphony to the musicians. Study your parts carefully, he warned. We must give our best performance. The prince has kept us here far too long, and if this symphony has the effect I think it will, we should all be home by the end of the month. Hooray, the musicians cheered. They set to work learning their parts. On the night of the performance, the orchestra was already on stage when Prince Nicholas and his guests entered the candlelit theater. Good evening, Haydn, said the prince. I hope you have something special for me tonight. Oh, very special indeed, Haydn answered. We shall perform a new work, my symphony in F-sharp minor. F-sharp minor? the prince asked. Is that not a rather unusual key? Why, yes, it is, Haydn responded. As you are about to hear, this is a rather unusual symphony. The emotions of my fellow musicians inspired the music. We hope that you will find our performance enlightening. A quizzical look passed over Prince Nicholas's face as Haydn took his place on stage and picked up his violin. The hall was in total silence. All the musicians looked to Haydn for their cue. He gave a slight nod of his head, and as a rush of music burst forth from the strings and swooped down from the stage. Explosive chords emerged with surging melodies as streams of quick, repetitive notes enclosed the audience in a whirlpool of tension. Prince Nicholas grasped the arms of his chair. This is angry music, he thought. For the first time, the prince was feeling the musician's frustration over having to remain at Esterhaza. The second movement began quite differently. The notes did not rush forward as they had in the first movement. Instead, light splashes of sound trickled from the violins. The violas and cellos joined in. A sorrowful tune rose from the stage and passed from one instrument to the next, first to a violin and then to an oboe. A tear rolled down the prince's cheek. This music is beautiful and yet so sad, he thought. For the first time, the prince was feeling the musician's sorrow over being separated from their families. When the third movement began, Prince Nicholas smiled. He could hear at once that it was based on a dance called the minuet. How graceful, he thought, as the violins played the opening notes. Just then the horns and cellos broke in. Blap! At first the prince thought they had made a mistake. Those stupid musicians played a wrong note, he grumbled. But then the orchestra repeated the passage, and it happened again. The prince frowned. He remembered all the dances that had been taken place at Esterhaza that summer. Prince Nicholas loved to dance, but he knew in his heart he was a terrible dancer, always stumbling and stomping on the ladies' toes. The prince scowled at the orchestra. They are mocking me, he thought. For the first time, the prince was feeling the musician's contempt for being treated so cruelly. By the end of the third movement, Prince Nicholas was thinking, I have had quite enough of this new symphony. But then the fourth movement began and it was magnificent. Every instrument strained with sound as waves of glorious music washed over the audience. The prince was fully enjoying the music when suddenly the orchestra stopped. After a brief pause, the musicians began playing a slow, melancholy tune. 
What is this? thought the prince. He leaned forward and eyed the orchestra carefully. Quite unexpectedly, two performers, an oboist and a horn player, stood up, closed their music, snuffed out their candles, and left the stage. The prince was shocked. What in the world is happening, he thought. He was just about to say something when the bassoon player stood up and did the same thing. A few seconds later, a second oboist left. A horn player followed, then the string bass player, and then the cellist. One by one, each musician left the stage. In the end, only Haydn and Tomasini remained, playing a slow, haunting duet. Then, like all the others, they stood up, closed their music, snuffed out their candles, and left the stage. An awkward hush fell over the audience. The musicians waited anxiously backstage. Haydn peered nervously from behind the curtain into the darkened theater. The prince sat motionless in his chair. He stared at the empty stage and thought about the music he had just experienced. Then he lifted his hands and slowly began to clap. Bravo, Haydn, bellowed the prince. You have made your point. I realize now that I have kept the musicians here far too long. Summer has passed and their families are waiting. Go to your rooms, everyone, and pack your bags. Tomorrow we head for home. Farewell, musicians. Farewell, Haydn. Farewell, Esther Haza. And that is the end of the Farewell Symphony. This page is more about the symphony in the 18th century. I'm not going to read it to you because it's pretty long, but it does talk about the instruments that make up the symphony. And we have a bassoon, a horn, oboe, cello, viola, violin, and bass. And they're missing probably a harpsichord and possibly some singers. And that is the end of the story. I hope you enjoyed the Farewell Symphony. Farewell to you. What an amazing story. I'm so glad that Haydn, with the help of his musicians, was able to help convince Prince Nicholas that it was time to go home and see their families. Thank you, Mrs. Broughton, for sharing this beautiful story with us. I'm sure it's well loved by your students at the DeWitt schools. You know, you guys, all of this talk about string instruments and the string family and violins and violas, especially the viola, um, it's really making me want to make my own string instrument. So why don't you join me with that? You're going to need a bowl and some rubber bands. For today's at-home activity, I'm going to show you how to make a basic string instrument with things that you have at home. And you only need two things. The first thing you need is a bowl. I chose this one just for you, Christine. And you need some rubber bands. Now, when you're picking out your rubber bands, you wanna make sure that your rubber bands, when you use them, they're not so tight that you can't make them bounce or vibrate. So this one wouldn't work on this bowl because it can't even quite stretch all the way. So instead, I'm going to use a couple different rubber bands on my bowl. And the reason why you want to use a bowl is because you need a, what's called a resonating chamber, which is a really fancy word for a sound amplifier. Because you know, if you just play a rubber band by itself, it's not gonna make a very loud sound. But if you play the rubber band on the bowl or on that resonating chamber, it doesn't have to be a bowl, it could be other things too, like a Kleenex box or a mug or something like that. If you listen, it makes a much louder sound and it changes the pitch just ever so slightly. So all that I'm doing here is I'm wrapping the rubber bands around the bowl. That way I can play. And I have no idea how this is going to sound. I just picked four rubber bands that I thought looked cool and sounded cool. And the reason why I chose four is that's how many strings are on a 
viola and a violin and a cello and a bass. But you know, we learned about the viola today, so those are the ones that I care about. So once I'm done with that, you can see that my bowl has the rubber bands wrapped around it and I can play them and they'll make sounds. Ooh, that sounded really neat. I'm plucking the strings. I'm wondering if you remember what the name for that is. Oh, it's a pizzicato. Let's see, pizzicato. Ooh, you can have a lot of fun with this activity at home. So enjoy making your own string instrument. I hope you had as much fun as I did learning about the string family today. I'd like to thank Christine from the Lansing Symphony Orchestra, as well as Michigan State University, for sharing everything she did on the viola today. I'd like to thank Mrs. Broughton from DeWitt Schools for reading a beautiful story about Joseph Haydn. And I'd like to thank our sponsors for making sure that we can be LSO Kids, Jackson National Life, MSU FCU, Comerica, and the Ari Olds Foundation. I can't wait to see you again and learn more about the symphony orchestra with you. See you soon, LSO Kids.